Okay. I think that we can start. Okay. Good morning, dear colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, students. Welcome to the ceremony for the awarding of the honorary degree in environmental and land planning engineering to Professor Juan Manuel Rodicio Lema, who is Professor Emeritus of Chemical Engineering at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. For those who don't know me, I am Alberto Taliercio. I, I am the Dean of the School of Civil, Environmental and Land Management Engineering of Politecnico. And I am honored to serve as Master of Ceremonies here at the, this prestigious event. Professor Lema is spending a week in Milano. He's participating in the fifth IWA International Conference on Ecotechnologies for Wastewater Treatment as a member of the program committee. And this gave us the opportunity of awarding him of the honorary degree in attendance despite the ongoing pandemic emergency, rather, rather than remotely. The program of the ceremony is as follows. First, Francesca Malpei, professor of wastewater treatment engineering, will illustrate the academic, scientific, and professional career of Juan Lema. Then, Professor Lema will, held, will hold sorry, his lecture magistralis entitled Environmental Engineering Committed to a Better World. And after that, the head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Professor Alberto Guadagnini, will illustrate the motivations for the awarding of the honorary degree. And finally, the ceremony will end with the delivery of the diploma to Professor Lema. And I will now give the floor to my colleague, Francesca Malpei. Please, Francesca. Dear Dean, thank you. Dear Director, dear colleagues and friends from Politecnico di Milano and the University of Santiago de Compostela, dear participant to the fifth Iowa EcoSTP conference, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure and emotion to introduce Professor Juan Maurizio Rodrigo Lema. And even more, being in presence with several people attending, including Professor Lema's colleagues and family. Others are connected in streaming. I can only think at this important ceremony with a sense of relief and perspective. After so many months that have been anything but easy for us and the whole world. A, long, a more than 40 year long career Professor Lema has been and is still a pioneer in the field of environmental biotechnologies. In fact, I don't think anyone really noticed that he recently retired, except for the fact that in 2019, he had received the honor of Emeritus Professor from the University of Santiago de Compostela, as you can see in my back. Combining fundamental and applied research, Professor Lema is one of the leading scientists guiding the evolution of the aim and meaning of wastewater treatment technologies. From pollution removal techniques designed to comply with standards and to protect the natural waters, to the new paradigm, a set of innovative and integrated sustainable processing and technologies able to produce energy and resources in a circular economy perspective. 
the challenges and state of the art of this evolution were very well described in the book that you can see behind me, edited in 2017 by Professor Lema and Sonia Schwarz. The book indeed contains the outcomes of a coast action that Professor Lema had planned and has coordinated, named Conceiving Wastewater Treatment in 2020. This action involved researchers from 30 European countries. And this is the first meeting. Somewhere in behind, I'm also there. As a follow-up and from the experience of this coast action, Professor Lema launched a new series of international water association specialized conference, Eco Technologies for Wastewater Treatment, ECO-STP. It's indeed not a coincidence that this ceremony is taking place in the last day of the fifth edition, organized by our department, entitled Impacting the Environment with Innovation in Wastewater Treatment. Professor Juan Lema was born in a middle-class family of Santiago. He studied industrial chemical engineering and got his doctorate in the University of Santiago in 1975. It comes naturally to think, at least to me, <laughs> that it was uh, his mother, Adelaide, who studied chemistry to give the spark and oxygen to Juan's passion for a research and scientific career. Perhaps maybe it's just an assumption, but I'm a mother and I'm really convinced of this. Once doctorate, he immediately started teaching at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, where he held for two years the position of head of department of the chemical engineering. Soon after, he obtained the chair of chemistry engineering at the University of Santiago de Compostela, where he has been ever since, holding important academic positions. I'm listing here just a few head of Department of Chemical Engineering, head of the Environmental Engineering course, promoter and first dean of School of Engineering, promoter and first head of the Spanish Conference of Chemical Engineering deans. He also promoted the creation of distinguished research groups. The bio group was found in 1985 is now composed, as you can see here, by 60 people, including 12 professors. The research line evolved from the beginning, but are still focused on the three original keywords, bio, environment, and engineering. It's indeed a worldwide renowned research group on biotechnologies, managing around 30 projects a year and publishing an average of 50 paper a year, papers a year, sorry. With my colleagues of the environmental section of our department, we have, we have had several opportunities to visit the bio group and collaborate, not only with Professor Lema, but uh, with other researchers. And we appreciated not just the very high standard of uh, equipments and pilots, but also and most the quality of the research striving to generate scientific and technological knowledge to support the development of society and environment in a human and stimulating environment. More recently, 2015, Professor Juan Lema founded and coordinated for some years the Cretus Institute. Cretus is the acronym of Cross Research in Environmental Technologies. The mission is to develop, develop sustainable technologies that recover resources while minimizing environmental impacts and risk. Capturing the whole meaning of the word sustainability, Cretus is designed as a strategic center that brings together researchers from different disciplines and departments, biology, physics, economics, chemistry, engineering, technological research. Cretus hosts an average of 70 PhD students a year, a year, all the year. 
Allow me now to get in more details about the research path of Professor Lehmann. At first, he focused particularly on anaerobic digestion, and it is still going on. Anaerobic processes are a wide range of environmentally friendly and versatile solutions that are now key and pivotal, not only for the routine treatment of concentrated biodegradable organic streams, but also and mostly in frontier researches to transform liquid, solid, and gaseous waste streams into bioproducts and biofuels. The history of current knowledge on anaerobic digestion dates back to the 70s and 80s of the last century. Thanks to a group of researchers and scientists, including Professor Lema and Professor Alberto Rozzi from our Politecnico. In the picture behind me, you can see some of them gathered at Lake Maggiore in Italy during an event focused on the setup of methods for the measurement of anaerobic activities. Professor Lema and Professor Rozzi are at your right hand in the bottom row. During these and following years, Professor Lema and his group contributed very significantly to the development of fundamental and applicative knowledge on, just to mention a few examples, USB reactors operation, treatment of toxic and recalcitrant compounds, advanced control of digesters, modeling anaerobic fermentation under a thermodynamic perspective. At last, I mentioned the most recent studies and models for the selective production of volatile fatty acids and then poly polyhydroxyalkanoates and then bioplastics from waste streams. And in 2013, Professor Lema organized and chaired one of the most successful Iowa World Conference on anaerobic digestion. The title was Recovering Bioresources for the World, representing very well the paradigm shift I have already mentioned. The excellent sessions were alternated by frequent open scientific discussion and social events. The friendly atmosphere and the scientific community feeling that characterize the conference can be well appreciated in this picture. Moving forward to other topics, we find the studies of Professor Lema on fungal and enzymatic bioreactors. At the beginning, he explored the capacity of fungi's oxidative enzymes to treat hardly biodegradable compounds. Then he conceived and developed developed fungal bioreactors in continuous operation to degrade recalcitrant compounds, such as synthetic dyes. Finally, in the last years, he focused on the immobilization of enzymes on nanoparticles. In continuity with the previous research topics, Professor Lema is now also looking after the degradation and removal of recalcitrant compounds micro, uh, in micro concentration and contaminants of emerging concern. It is this indeed another challenge that wastewater treatment engineering has to confront with, pointing out how innovative and scientific advancements are at the same time needed and present in this sector. Being part of the European project Poseidon, he and his group were among the first to study the fate and biotransformation of pharmaceuticals and endocrine compounds disruptors during sludge anaerobic digestion. Groundbreaking studies followed on the role of enzymes and co-metabolism to achieve biodegradation. Professor Lema has always had a strong connection with the industrial world in two perspectives, to develop effective, tre effective treatment for industrial wastewater uh, treatment and to apply and transfer the, the results of his research to the industry. This attitude led him to be the first director of the Technological Transfer Center of the University of Santiago and to have a very significant portfolio of research projects funded by industries. Besides, he holds uh, 20 patents, nine of which 
European or international, and five patents licensed to industries. As mentioned before, more than 30 years of fruitful re relationship and collaboration bind the environmental section and our department with Professor Lena. On my back, you can catch him in the most recent occasion, the PhD discussion, the PhD discussion. One was, uh, we were honored to have one as part of the commission. Moving towards the conclusion of this laudatio, now the time has come to complete the profile of Professor Lema with some of his achievements I did not mention yet. In 2020, Professor Lema ranks amongst the 2% highest impact researchers in biotechnology, according to the Stanford list. He coordinated and participated 71 projects, 24 of which funded by the Europe. He is author of over 400 publications, age 65, with an average of over 40 citation, citations a year. And in the last year, I think much more than this. He is honorary professor of Queensland University and Dr. Honoris Causa by the Catholic, Catholic University of Valparaiso in Chile. Professor Lema is a rigorous and enthusiastic person, open and people-minded, a leading scientist and a recognized landmark in environmental engineering. Throughout his career, marked by so many achievements, Professor Lema has made a point to combine fundamental and applied research, to face scientific and technological challenges, to devote to the training of young and excellent researchers, and to grow new realities and ideas, fully adhering to the mission of an academic engineer. In the end, we must recognize that he has fostered environmental engineering to serve for a better and broader protection of our lives and society and of the whole environment. The great esteem and affection around him here at Polytechnic and in the world are proof of this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Francesca. And now we will listen to the uh, Lectio Magistralis held by Professor Lema. So, Juan, please, the floor is yours. Dean of the School of uh, Civil, Environmental, and Land Management Engineering, Director of the Department of Civil, Environmental Engineering, authorities, colleagues, students, family, and friends. Prima di tutto, voglio ringraziare di cuore il Politecnico di Milano, una delle scuole di ingegneria più prestigiose d'Europa, per il grande onore che mi concede. Ringrazio in particolare la Scuola di Ingegneria Civile e Ambientale del Territorio, della persona e del suo direttore, professore Alberto Talercio, il Dipartimento di Ingegneria Civile e Ambientale nella persona e del suo direttore, professore Alberto Guaglianini, e molto affettuosamente alla mia madrina, la professoressa Francesca Malpei, direttrice della sezione di Ingegneria Ambientale per l'iniziativa e il sostegno. Il mio rapporto con il Politecnico di Milano è iniziato più di 35 anni fa, grazie al professor Alberto Rocci, pionere e promotore della digestione anaerobica in Europa. Da quando ci siamo conosciuti a Barcellona abbiamo mantenuto un rapporto professionale e personale molto stretto. Abbiamo curato progetti e scambi di studenti universitari e laureati, sempre con grande collaborazione. Tra l'altro, fino a un anno fa, sono stato il coordinatore istituzionale dello scambio Erasmus tra le nostre università, avendo realizzato un numero di scambi molto importanti. 
ricordo con affetto il primo studente italiano venuto a Santiago Marco Trevisano e tanti altri venuti dopo. Il Politecnico è una destinazione molto apprezzata dagli studenti dell'Università di Santiago di Compostela per il suo prestigio e rigore. Il professor Rocci, mio caro Alberto, sarà sempre pensieri, presente nei miei pensieri. Perché anche grazie a lui ho potuto trovare un gruppo umano e professionale di grande valore, un gruppo di ricerca riconosciuto in Europa e che proprio in questi giorni organizza il congresso internazionale Equistipi nell'ambito delle conferenze AIWA. Ho fatto un fantastico soggiorno sabbatico tre anni fa presso il Dipartimento di Ingegneria Civile, Ambientale e Territoriale, in cui ho potuto, oltre ad apprendere con loro, constatare la loro qualità umana. Ho anche avuto modo di visitare la fabbrica della bioenergia, un laboratorio ideato dal Politecnico in memoria del professore Alberto Rocci una moderna struttura con progetti visionari. Il mio soggiorno è stato davvero immendicabile. Grazie mille Francesca, Roberto Canciani, Elena, Manuela, Aliana Celino, Andrea, Stefano, Cugi, Micol, Roberto Di Cosmo, Ariana Caltenacci, Viola. Today is a very emotional day for me. A day on which the prestigious Politecnico di Milano grants me the great honor of being awarded with the laureate honorem in environmental and land management engineering, a great honor that I accept with modesty and satisfaction. First, I would like to thank all you, both those attending the ceremony at this room and those connected through the internet, wherever you are for accompanying me in such a special occasion. Thanks are, are in order to my research group, which has supported me for more than 30 years and in which I have felt loved and respected. Thank you, Vio Group, and particularly those who join me today, Maite, Sonia, Rosa, Sindo, and also Gloria and Jose Manuel. Of course, Thanks to my dear family, here represented by my wife, Marilou, and my daughter, Marta. Unfortunately, my younger daughter, Iria, was not able to come. Un vecino fuerte, Iria. To uh, my parents, Manolo y Lalita, my parents-in-law, Moncho y Lola, my sister, Pili, and her husband, Aniceto, my son-in-law, Richard, and my incredible three grandchildren, Luis, Oscar, and Daniel, for their love, support, and encouragement, and for helping me to improve. Thanks a lot. I took this photo three years ago in Melbourne, Australia, in the big weekend celebration, the big weekend of sustainability and a unequivocal sign of the environmental awareness of a part of the society. Obviously, this feeling did not appear spontaneously, and it should be considered as the result of a long period of maturation. The environment as such has not been a concern for society until very few years ago. The war was simply a wealth warehouse for human beings, including fossil resources, plants, and animals under an egoistic anthropocentric vision. The industrialization of the late 19th century, with its negative impact on the natural environment, favored the begin at the beginning of the 20th century the emergence of a conservation movement led by who would become president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, a movement in strong contrast against the laissez-faire position. Although some may consider it as a simple epiphenomenon, the truth is that at that time it was a serious criticism of a predatory developmental model towards environment. 
The existence of this alternative minority discourse made it possible to develop later new ways of understanding the relationship between human activities and the environment. Different negative experiences caused by irresponsible abuse of our habitat had an influence on this dynamic. An example is the dust bowl phenomenon which occurred in the United States in the 1930s that caused a severe famine affecting several million people. These ecological disasters help raise awareness of the problem and modify environmental behaviors and policies. But that will only happen if the following circumstances occur. A. This disaster is associated with an economic industrial malpractice. B. The adverse consequences of continuing with this course of action are made explicit. C. Viable alternatives are offered. And D. That all the above is raised by the credible source. Science and scientists continue, despite the rise of the denial movements, to be a reference and rigorous information for our fellow citizens. Hence the importance of girls like Rachel Carson. Rachel Louise Carson, an American biologist and environmentalist, published her book, The Silent Spring, in 1962 in which she warned for the first time worldwide of the impact of the human activity of pesticides, particularly DDT on fauna and flora, can be considered as the first call for attention to the public. The book had a huge social and even political impact. Laws were passed and much more attention was paid to the use of agrochemicals to prevent pests and improve crops. It has raised awareness not only in the scientific community, but also in an important sector of the general population. This call for attention could be considered somehow at the beginning of the environmentalism, a political, economical, and social movement that emerged in the industrialized countries in the third quarter of the 20th century. An important milestone took place in the early 1970s under the initiative of the Italian economist, industrialist, and philanthropist Aurelio Pequet from Torino, and the Scottish chemist Alexander Keane, a group of 36 scientists, economists, and politicians from different countries met in Rome for a two-day session. The meeting, sponsored by the Agnelli Foundation, was intended to discuss the changes that were taking place on the planet due to human activities. Two years later, the Club of Rome was formally established in Switzerland as the first think tank of environmental issues. In 1972, they published its first report, The Limits to Growth. The report, commissioned to a group of experts in systems theory from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, analyzed scenarios and options available in society to harmonize sustainable progress and environmental constraints. Its publication had a great impact on the international level, on the political, economic, and scientific fields by highlighting the contradiction of the unlimited and uncontrolled consumption of material goods in a world of finite resources, thus achieving the inclusion of this topic in a major global debate. This initiative of the Club of Rome can be considered as the forerunner of the concept of sustainability, which implies the acceptance of natural limits to economic growth. In the early 80s, James Lovelock postulated Gaia hypothesis that the biosphere regulates the conditions of the planet in such a way that parameters such as temperature and atmospheric chemi chemistry adjust to values that allow a more hospital, hospitable coexistence of all species in a process known as homeostasis. Similarly to that occurs in the regulation of function in living bodies. The question to be discussed is whether Gaia responsiveness will be strong enough to provide an effective feedback in controlling environmental conditions, including climate. At the end of the 20th century, a new uh, movement strongly emerged, in which the care and conservation of the environment should be a key driver. 
This defines the ecocentric ecology, which differs, differs from the anthropocentric ecology in the goal pursued. Ecocentrism seeks to go beyond conservating ecology and seeks to ensure that all actions are aimed at preserving ecosystems and the species, regardless of their economic value to humans and not just to preserve their health. More recently, the publication of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation report on the economics of a secular economy invites society to imagine an economy in which today's goods are tomorrow's resources, in a virtuous cycle, a strategy that fosters prosperity in a world of finite resources. This change in perspective is important to address many of today's fundamental challenges. Traditional linear consumption patterns, take, make, dispose, are incompatible with the limitation of the availability of resources that are challenged by the demands of, for the growing, of the growing and increasingly prosperous world population. Nowadays, the circular economy concept is fully accepted in more of developed countries, and more particularly in Europe. And of course, the enormous impact that everything related with climate change is having on the society. The concern about the effects that increase of greenhouse gases concentration in our atmosphere may have on our lives has catalyzed a very strong action plan on an international scale, probably the largest common collective effort in the history, in the history of the humanity. This process is already having powerful and practical results on our lives. Thus, for example, the introduction of the carbon dioxide emission rights promoted after the Kyoto Protocol has included a new cost in business activities, which is provoking the radical modification of markets such as the electricity generation. The increase in emission cost has led to the progressive closure of thermal power plants with fossil fuels such as coal throughout Europe. These were facilities that, regardless the environmental factor, were completely economically viable. Let me introduce to you Santolina melidensis, a beautiful flower that grows on serpentinic soils with a high content of magnesium and heavy metals. These characteristics means that the, planet is, the plant is developed exclusively in a small area in, in my region, Galicia, where the construction of a highway was planned. Due to the popular demand, the highway was diverted. This is a very good example of how ecocentric thinking is modifying our habits. Even though Santolina has no economic value, that it doesn't produce any special welfare, the decision was made to preserve it, no matter whether this implies an extra economic effort. We also observe a strong evidence in the political world. In 1979, Daniel Berelas was the first environmentalist elected to sit in a national parliament in the Council of Switzerland. Now, 30 years later, very active parties whose main interest is the preservation of the environment have emerged in most European countries, notably influencing economic policies and representing a relevant factor, for example, in the European Parliament. As an example of this increase in influence, it is important to observe how in such a relevant country as Germany, Annalena Baerbock from the Greens has a serious change of being elected as chancellor next September. This political influence is very clear even in parties that are not exclusively environmentalist, such as in Spain, where the Socialist Party government has set up a vice presidency specifically dealing with the ecological transition. But undoubtedly, the most far-reaching global manifestation implying not only environmental aspects, is approval in 2015 by the General Assembly of the United Nations of the Agenda for a Sustainable Development, an action plan for people, the planet, and prosperity. 
a declaration that could be equated with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, also approved by United Nations in 1948. The Sustainable Development Goals, a collection of 17 interlinked global goals, integrates the three dimensions of sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental. Over the years, engineering has contributed in a decisive way to the well-being of the society, and particularly by providing solutions to preserve health, such as setting up sewers, as the impressive cloaca maxima in the Roman Empire, or those built up in the main cities in Europe from the 19th century to avoid polemics like cholera. Also, it's worth mentioning the design of drinking water system from the Roman aqueduct to chlorination system, which has prevented millions of deaths. Engineering has also made, uh, contributed to mitigating the impact of the waste water with the first installation implemented in the Benedictine monasteries in the 12th century, followed by the irrigation systems like the one in Berlin in 19th century, and the more efficient trickling filters such as the one in the Hague at the beginning of the 20th century. From 1920, uh, 1920s, the massive implementation all over the world of the activated slot systems allowed the impact of water pollution to be reduced. Of course, all of them uh, very significantly advances that have helped, above all, to preserve the well-being of human society. Concerning waste, the conception of sanitary landfills, which could later be recovered as urban parks, represented a, an enormous advance in relation to waste dumps that caused enormous environmental and landscape degradation. In any case, this solution is still active in most of the world, represents a huge waste of resources. In line with the movements that we have just analyzed, engineering has renewed its commitment to society, seeking objectives compatible with social demands, evolving from a conception of sanitary engineering to an environmental engineering view, whose fundamental goal is to preserve the nature regardless of the economic value of or the impact, the impact on human health in a parallel line to what the change of model from anthro to ecocentrism has meant. So that environmental engineering becomes a discipline with a completely will to find solution to society's problem, a discipline with a clear attitude of commitment to nature. The three R's uh, principle introduced in 2005 by Prime Minister of Japan in the G8 meeting implied a change of mentality in a solid waste management which established a new hierarchy in terms of priorities for action. Particularly, the concept of reuse and recycling launched a revolution both in the waste collection and on its subsequent management which has posed, which has posed new challenges for environmental engineering. Today, an ambitious network of industrial facilities is being implemented in most developed countries, which undoubtedly marks a new course in the field of resource recovery. Let me now introduce the 3R concept, although now applied to the wastewater treatment plants or under a new vision to wastewater resource recovery facilities, a concept developed during the Cost Action Water 2020 that I had the privilege of coordinate and that has been formulated in a collective book by more than 160 authors. Reduce not only energy consumption, but environmental impacts, such as greenhouse gases emissions or micropollutants, the footprint and costs as well. Reuse treated water and generated as large with sufficient quality and recover resources such as metals, nutrients, of cellulose, or even produced goods, such as bioplastics or energy. Moreover, the 3R concept can also be applied for wastewater treatment under a process vision, depending on the intensity of the technical modification that arise. Retrofitting, when new units are included to increase capacity or efficiency. Redesigning, when substantial modifications are made 
on conventional treatment trends or reimagining when the treatment of resources recovery systems are based on new principles, very different from those of the activated sludge plants. I would uh, now like to present to you some innovation developed within our research team. By a group, in the last 20 years, framed this new vision of environmental engineering. Reducing energy consumption through the autotrophic elimination of nitrogen in the central line through the ELAM process, or in the water mainstream through the aqua ELAM, both based on animal activity and developed in cooperation with Aqualia. Reducing the impact of micropollutants through the SEMPAC technology, developed jointly with Suez, in which involves the use of activated carbon in the reactor, and reducing space requirements as energy for the treatment of industrial waters through the anaerobic sludge granule reactor technology also developed with Suez. Reusing high quality water and minimizing impacts through Siam technology also developed in cooperation with Suez. And recovering more energy through an optimized co-digestion using the OptiBlender methodology now implemented by ECODA company. Recovering nitrogen by ammonia stripping or phosphorus as, as estrubite in processes developed jointly with Aquelia. And finally, producing bioplastics or setting up a protocol to selectively produce volatile fatty acids through anaerobic fermentation based on the metabolic model that allows steering the fermentation towards the desired products. Some of this innovation will be analyzed this afternoon at the final session of the AQSTP conference. The strategy of our group has been consistent from the very beginning, throughout the years gaining a profound understanding of the physical, chemical, and biological mechanisms, and based on this, developing suitable technology to solve real problems. From that research experience and commitment, I would like to share with you my deepest conviction that despite all, all the evils that afflict our society and the environment, there are many reasons for hope. Recall that even Sigmund Freud embraced this sentiment when responding to the concerns of an Albert Einstein tormented by the threats of his time. In a well-known work published in Nature in, two, in, in 2011, Steven Pinker criticizes those who deny that the present is better than the past. He claims this is due to, the, to a bias from romantics, nostalgics, and cynics who remains oblivious to, the, uh, uh, to what data says. I invite you to revise, to review, the data compiled by Hans Sola and Anna Rosling in their book, Factfulness, where they analyze the historical evolution of aspects as relevant to, of the humanity as the dramatic decrease in the percentage of the population living in extreme poverty or the number of deaths due to violent episodes as well as the increase in literacy, life expectancy, or the number of protected species. We will conclude, as did Pinker, and many other others, that, should, that we should maintain our hope in an ideal of progress. I would like to end my speech by claiming the role of science in general, and particularly of environmental engineering sending an optimistic message. Our world is facing a radical change of model in which our relationship with nature will play a central role. As with in any emerging movement, resistances will in uh, inevitably appear. In this journey, the most important, as the great Leonardo da Vinci teaches us, is to be clear about the destination point. Set your course for a star, and you will be able to navigate through any storm. Our responsibility and commitment will be to put all together all, all uh, knowledge and know-how at the service of the noblest cause that the human being can have to contribute to the well-being of our society and the health of this planet, our mutual home. Thank you very much for your attention.
Grazie tanti. Thank you Juan, thank you for this speech which was not only interesting but also very passionating and stimulating especially for people like me who are not particularly involved in in the subject of environmental engineering but it helped me very much in understanding how individually and collectively we can contribute to improve the quality of our environment. So thank you very much. And now I will give the floor to the director of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Alberto Guadagnini, who will explain the motivations for the uh, awarding of the honorary degree to Professor Lehman. Thank you, Alberto. Dear Dean Tagliercio, dear Professor Lemma, dear Professor Malpei, Professor Czernuski, dear colleagues, dear delegates and participants uh, to the IWA ECHO STP conference, students, ladies and gentlemen. It truly fills me with excitement uh, being here and contribute to honor Professor Lemma with the let me say it in Italian, laurea magistrale in ad honorem in environmental and land management engineering at our institution. Let me start uh, this brief speech by saying that today's event uh, truly shines brightly after a very complex year and a half. We all know it. Seeing all of you here and being aware that we are also in the presence of a considerable number of people following the live feed fills me with a thrill that I could have never fathomed just a few months ago, truly. I'm particularly thrilled to complement the portrait of Professor Lema, which has been vividly depicted by Francesca a few minutes ago, by underlying the intimate connection between Juan and our department, which I have the honor to represent here. This link rests on the solid grounds of a continuous synergy that has been fostered truly across two millennia and has served as the glue collating and further propelling the activities of an impressive amount of young researchers. And I'm underlying the concept of synergy which has truly gone beyond scientific collaboration. The very first brush strokes to the beautiful canvas that has been painted across the years uh, date back to the last decade of the past millennium. And it is with pleasure and emotion that I remember the start of that collaboration with uh, our dear Professor Ross Rozzi on research which was keyed to characterization of anaerobic biodegradation processes of organic pollutants. This was already said, but there are no, not enough words to underline the importance of that period. This was the beginning of an intense sharing of master, PhD level students, which resulted in a quite impressive record of publications. I'm also honored to emphasize, uh, allow me with a little bit of pride, that Professor Lema chose our department as the venue for his sabbatical in 2018, with a focus on modern environmental technologies. And during that period, Professor Lema was very much engaged in the research and PhD level educational activities at the department. Well, in addition to research, Professor Lema has always been actively engaged in visionary educational activities. He played a key role in designing and implementing innovative engineering oriented tracks aimed at applying novel technologies for the protection of the environment. His fingerprint is clearly visible in the introduction of modern approaches to exploring critical feedbacks between chemical engineering and environmental biotechnologies. In this context, and very importantly, on the side of technology foresight and development, he successful, successfully promoted the integration of various flavors of chemical engineering approaches into environmental remediation technologies. In doing so, he conceived, developed, and applied innovative technologies leading to an impressive set of patents, as we have seen. 
His research has always been characterized by innovation and creative thinking, leading to real and, as you have seen, quantifiable benefits. And I'm convinced that this should truly come as an inspiration to young generations and motivate them to be driven by always asking themselves the question, well, at the end of the day, what do we know today that we did not know yesterday? Embracing the spirit of open innovation, which is key to the advancement of our modern society, Francesca reminded you that in 2015, Professor Lema founded Cretus. And his activity has always been intimately connected to a variety of research lines that are at the heart of the mission and vision of our Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. As such, let me come to reading the formal motivations for the honorary degree, which is deserved for the outstanding leading role of Professor Juan Lema in the context of teaching, designing, and implementing groundbreaking and innovative engineering tracks geared towards the protection of the environment with the strong feedback with the industrial and public sectors, for pioneering and path-opening research in the combination of processes to remove pollutants and recover the quality of natural resources, resulting in a variety of high-profile patents, worldwide renowned scientific excellence in the field of environmental biotechnology. For the continuous and very intimate links of Professor Juan Lema with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, leading to an unprecedented level of synergic scientific works and personal interactions. And finally, for the inspiration that the legacy of this honorary degree will provide students of an educational path associated with the growing need of the society towards environmental engineering, requiring a high professional level and ethics leading towards circularity and the sustainability of feedbacks between the environment and human activities. Thank you. And now we delve into the very final and exciting moment of today, which is the awarding of the Laurea Magistrale ad Honorem, which is presided by our Dean Alberto Tagliercio. Thank you very much for participating in this ceremony and uh, uh, let's felicitate once more with Professor Lema for this important achievement. Okay. <laughs>